Hello, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. This is a keynote talk for a joint European conference on visual computing that uh, was scheduled to take place in uh, Tübingen today, um, but due to the uh, coronavirus pandemic and the associated disruptions, it is taking place entirely virtual. I put up this uh, photograph of lovely Tübingen on the slide uh, to say that uh, it is a lovely place and I'm looking forward to coming back and visiting it again uh, someday. Many good friends live there. So this is our agenda for today. We're going to begin with a general introduction to the pursuit of photorealism and then we are going to review two recent works uh, from my lab. One is called Free View Synthesis. It is a work that was made public uh, about a month ago and was presented at the European Conference uh, on Computer Vision uh, just a few weeks ago. It's very fresh and uh, I'm going to show you some results and review some things we learned. And then we're going to do something very special. I'm going to present a work for the first time that has never been presented outside my lab uh, before. You're going to be the first to see this. This is called Nerf++. Plus Plus. Uh, it is a new work and a paper that we are going to post online uh, probably in about a week and I wanted to do something special for you since you invited me uh, to give this keynote and I wanted uh, you to be the first to see uh, something. Uh, so this is going to be the first time uh, Nerf++ Plus Plus is presented outside my lab and you are going to be the first to see this. So let's begin with a general introduction. Uh, it's tempting to think of the pursuit of uh, photorealism in terms of two cultures, the physics-based culture and the image-based culture. I am borrowing the term, the two cultures, from uh, C.P. Snow, a novelist and scientist who wrote an essay uh, with this name in the 50s and it was a very important essay in 20th century intellectual life. Uh, it described uh, two cultures in 20, 20th century uh, intellectual uh, life and, and the phrase um, has become uh, quite well known. Uh, so we're going to apply it here to uh, the pursuit of photorealism. And I went back 25 years uh, for this talk and looked over the program of SIGGRAPH 1995, 25 years ago. And we see the representatives of two cultures very clearly. On the left, we see a paper by James Arvo, applications of irradiance tensors to the simulation of non-Lambertian phenomena. On the right, uh, a clear exemplar of the image-based approach, QuickTime VR, an image-based approach to virtual environment navigation. Both are single author papers. Apparently it was easier to publish single author papers um, at conferences like this uh, 25 years ago. So we see these two different approaches to the pursuit of photorealism and they are alive and well. Uh, we can look over the program of SIGGRAPH 2020 this year and again see very clear exemplars of these two cultures. Here's one um, exemplar of the physics-based culture, Langevin Monte Carlo rendering with gradient-based adaptation. On the right, we see an image-based uh, system, immersive light field video with a layered mesh representation. And um, the quality of the results has come a long way. We can look 
at the uh, images from 25 years ago, and we can look at the images from this year, and it's clear that significant progress has been made. And it's also clear that these two cultures are uh, still quite prominent and very well uh, represented. However, we can also question whether these really are two distinct culture, whether that would be uh, the most productive way uh, to view them. Consider, for example, this uh, wonderful uh, example of photorealism. This is, in fact, an interactive real-time demo uh, created by the Unity demo team two years ago that, in my view, attains photorealism. This is photorealism. This is a computer-generated, computer-simulated scene, and it, as far as I'm concerned, is photorealistic. This is uh, photorealism. The way this has been created very strongly relies on ideas from both cultures. The scene is simulated, the light transport is simulated in a rendering engine, but the assets are created with image-based techniques. The assets are created with photogrammetry. Uh, real images are mapped onto reconstructed three-dimensional objects to create texture maps, albedo maps, specular maps, and the representation of all the materials on all the objects here is directly acquired from images, directly acquired from reality. And we can see here the beautiful interplay of the light transport simulation in the rendering engine and the photorealistic materials, the photorealistic assets that are so critical to the photorealistic appearance of this scene. So the physics-based simulation makes the scene come alive. Uh, you see the light moving, you see the shadows. The objects are not, are not frozen, they're, they're, they're animated, but the photorealistic appearance is uh, afforded by the image-based 3D reconstruction and the image-based materials. Um, on all the objects. Here is another example that combines the two cultures to great effect. This is from a computer-generated uh, short film by Alex Roman called The Third and the Seventh. It was created more than a decade ago. Um, and this film, again, entirely computer-generated, created in a rendering engine, completely controlled by a rendering engine. This is computer graphics, but it is photorealistic. This, in my view, again, also attained photorealism. It is a fantastic example of the kind of thing that we are striving towards. And uh, a huge part of this photorealistic appearance is, of course, the image-based materials, the image-based assets. Of course, all the material appearance of all the objects in this scene is strongly acquired from reality. The texture maps, specular maps, the materials that you see here were taken from images, reconstructed from images. So again, the physics-based simulation makes the scene come alive. It allows us, as you could see, to change the depth of field, the camera properties, the lighting, uh, to control the scene. But the photorealistic appearance uh, is coming from the image-based uh, assets, the image-based material uh, specification. In fact, looking at these examples of photorealism, of photorealism that has actually been attained in computer graphics, we can argue that my title was somewhat misleading. At this point, we probably shouldn't be talking about towards photorealism as, uh, as if photorealism is some kind of aspirational goal that is out of our reach. In fact, we know how to attain photorealism. We've just seen examples of photorealism. We know how to achieve photorealism. It's just that the future is already here, as William Gibson said, it's just not very evenly distributed. The challenge at this point is not to uh, 
uh, take off the binary flag of attaining photorealism somewhere, but rather to enable the attainment of photorealism on a large scale so that you and I, anybody who is interested, can simulate any scene that they are interested photorealistically so that any uh, independent game developer, amateur, enthusiast content creator can imagine a scene and then create it in photorealistic quality and simulate it with photorealistic clarity and detail. That, to me, is the current challenge. That is what we should be working towards in the coming uh, decade or two. After this general introduction, uh, let me proceed to tell you about two relevant recent works from my lab. And both works are going to be very much examples of the image-based uh, culture. Um, I do like the physics-based approach. I think it's very important, and I think the ultimate solution must come from marrying physics-based and image-based techniques, just like these beautiful two examples of photorealism that I showed you have done. So the most prominent examples of photorealism in computer graphics to date have been attained by marrying image-based and physics-based techniques. And that is what I think the solution must look like in the future as well. However, right now, the most recent and most exciting work from my lab that I can present is very strongly based in the image-based uh, camp. Um, if you invite me to give this talk again in a year or two, I hope to show you some more work from the physics-based side, which we are interested in and are uh, working on, and ideally work that strongly combines ideas uh, from these two cultures. With that disclaimer, let's talk about the two uh, recent image-based rendering works from my uh, lab. With the note uh, that this general uh, research direction is nowadays commonly referred to as view synthesis. I think of view synthesis as a clever rebranding of image-based rendering. Uh, it is a more streamlined, uh, more memorable uh, term. So somewhat akin to deep learning, which is rebranding of neural networks, View synthesis um, is more or less a recent rebranding, and not so recent, um, but recently increasingly popular rebranding of image-based rendering. So we can call it view synthesis. It's good. It's a good term, I think. It's a good term to use. Uh, it's shorter. It's catchier. It's more memorable. And it is correct. But we also should remember that there is 25 plus years of history uh, in uh, this uh, research uh, direction. There are important uh, works uh, that have been done on image-based rendering for more than 25 years now. And any student, any young researcher who is coming into this field should not assume that uh, relevant view synthesis work and view synthesis work that they should know about started two years ago or uh, three years ago. You really should go back to the roots and review um, very important and very relevant and very informative image-based rendering work from the 90s, the 2000s, and all through uh, the 2010s. Let's start with a recent uh, paper uh, that we just presented at ECCV, the European Conference on Computer Vision, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, this has been driven by uh, Gernot Riegler. Uh, this is the result of um, a very substantial investment for an extended 
period of time by Gernot in which we were trying out many, many ideas and I kept coming back and saying this is not good enough, uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, realistic enough uh, to publish, we must work harder until we attain a satisfactory level of realism. And at some point that bar uh, has been passed. Um, so these are input images of a scene from the Tanks and Temples data set. Uh, you can see here Im handheld images uh, with Arno, who collected the Tanks and Temples data set, walking around this truck, uh, collecting a video uh, with, a, with a handheld camera. See, these are snapshots from this handheld video. Um, this is a truck outdoors, completely uncontrolled uh, outdoors environment in uh, San Pedro Market in San Jose. It's a lovely place. You're encouraged to... Uh, visit and you can see it's it's a real scene outside um, and here is a camera trajectory a new camera trajectory synthesized by free view synthesis our approach so this trajectory takes us through uh, a sequence of camera poses that have not been in the uh, input we are now going into the scene and walking around this scene freely after uh, it, it has been uh, captured with those images that I showed you. Here, free view synthesis is both the name of our technique and refers to our ambition, what we aspire to do, our goal, our aim. Our aim is to be able to walk through the simulated scene freely with no constraints. First of all, our input data should be uh, natural, something that should be very easy for people to acquire, like handheld video sequence. This to us is the canonical form of input. You take a camera, you take your iPhone out of your uh, pocket or your Android phone, you take a video, you walk around the scene, you image the scene with handheld video, um, you, push a, uh, you push a button, you wait a little while for some pre-processing to be done, after that, you can walk into the scene and just walk around the scene freely. Not just moving your viewpoint a little bit in between and near where the camera was, but really freely traveling through the scene as conventional computer graphics, as physics-based approaches allow you to do. We should strive towards the same level of freedom and flexibility that we see in conventional physics-based uh, computer uh, graphics. And you can see here that we've attained uh, substantial freedom and substantial realism. The results are not perfect, there are clear artifacts, there's clearly work that remains to be done, but it's, it's really quite good. Um, here are the original camera poses in green. Uh, this is where uh, the camera was uh, for those input images that were provided uh, to the technique. And in red, you see the trajectory of target camera poses that uh, was used for synthesis of this new sequence. And you can see that the red camera poses walk through the scene quite freely. They don't stick to being near uh, the green cameras. They don't just interpolate. They really walk into the scene quite a bit away from where the camera was. They, they walk about a meter or more towards uh, the truck, really walking into the scene, seeing the scene from different viewpoints at different uh, levels of detail. It's this kind of unconstrained, free uh, view synthesis that we are after. Well, let's talk about how this is done. Uh, this is an approach that is strongly rooted in classic 3D reconstruction. So first we do structure from motion to localize the cameras and triangulate a number of uh, very confident anchor points in the scene. We then reconstruct the scene in greater uh, detail using multi-view stereo. You see here a denser reconstruction 
from multi-view stereo, the scene is uh, covered in more uh, detail, more densely, but the reconstruction is also quite noisy. Multi-view stereo uh, can yield uh, results that are quite uh, noisy. And to deal with this noise, we then perform meshing. We perform surface reconstruction to reconstruct a cleaner uh, surface that covers the scene. This surface, this 3D reconstruction, is used as a scaffold for our technique. It is used as the scaffold for view synthesis. The view synthesis itself is done by a combination of two deep networks, an encoder and a decoder. The encoder operates on each input image. This can be done in pre-processing and extracts a feature vector for each pixel of each input image. So each input image is densely passed through an encoder and we end up with a tensor of feature vectors per pixel for each input image. Then, given a target view, feature vectors from a number of nearby input images are projected into the target view. This is where the 3D reconstruction comes in. For each nearby source input view, the feature vectors from that input view are back projected onto the 3D reconstruction, onto this geometric 3D scaffold, and then projected into the target view. This gives us a number of such projected images with corresponding depth values. And those images are images of the features, of the feature vectors encoded by the encoder. So we have several layers of these projected, fairly dense feature vectors with associated depth values splatted into the target view. We then have this recurrent decoder that goes through these projected images of feature vectors and integrates them into a clean color image. For each projected uh, set of feature vectors, it produces a dense color map, dense image, with associated confidence values. And then these colors and confidence values are integrated to produce a final color image. And this is the image that uh, you see synthesized by free view synthesis. Let's take a look at some results again, and now compare to relevant baselines, to relevant recent uh, view synthesis work. Here is a result on this truck sequence by local light field fusion. This is a technique published at SIGGRAPH 2019, um, and you can see that it doesn't work very well. It's, uh, it's really quite bad. Uh, this is primarily because we're taking this technique quite far from its comfort zone. It was designed primarily for a setting in which the input images are arranged in a nice regular grid. So uh, maybe you have a, a planar array of cameras, uh, a grid of cameras, and they take images. And then this local light field uh, fusion lets you interpolate between the views spent by these cameras, maybe go outside them, nearby, a little bit. This is very different from this unconstrained free view synthesis that uh, we um, aim to attain in this work. So the local light field fusion technique is taken very far uh, from its, uh, its modeling assumptions. Obviously, in our case, the cameras don't lie on a grid. Far from it, it's just uh, a more, more of a one-dimensional uh, trajectory uh, in, uh, in pulse space, a handheld, noisy camera that is really traveling through the scene, traveling into the scene over long distances, and then at test time, we really want to go into the scene and travel freely. 
Here's another technique published uh, at ECCV 2019 called extreme uh, view synthesis, uh, quite extreme indeed. Um, this, uh, this has interesting uh, aesthetic uh, qualities uh, to it. I can imagine it um, in an uh, MTV uh, video uh, as a kind of uh, special, uh, special effect. Um, but it is not quite uh, what we are aiming for. Uh, this is neural radiance fields, also known as uh, NERF, uh, that's published concurrently, in, uh, concurrently with our work in the same conference, ECCV uh, 2020. This is a very interesting work that takes a fairly radically different approach to the view synthesis problem and I will discuss it in more detail in the second part of my talk. Clearly, it doesn't quite hit the mark, although aesthetically, it again is very interesting. Um, it it uh, produces results that are not without uh, aesthetic appeal, um, but it's clearly not photorealistic. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting approach that we will analyze in, uh, in more detail. Here, again, are the results of our technique, uh, free view uh, synthesis. You can still see artifacts. It is not perfect, um, but it's clearly among this set of techniques. Um, it, it's, uh, it's clearly much closer uh, to where we want to be, to uh, what we are aiming for. Here is another scene from the Tanks and Temples data set. This is the M60 scene. Uh, you see here input images, that, just to show you what the scene actually uh, looks like and what kind of input uh, was provided to the uh, different approaches. This is one of the scenes that gives the Tanks and Temples data set its name. It was uh, uh, collected in a uh, tank uh, museum. Uh, these are the results of local light field uh, fusion. Here are the results of extreme view synthesis. Again, fairly interesting. Fairly interesting as a, uh, as a special effect. Uh, here is the output of neural radiance fields, or NERF. And you can see that it's, it's, it's doing something. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a catastrophic failure. It, it, it's not quite there, uh, but it's, it's clearly doing something. And here is free view synthesis. Uh, again, uh, there are clear artifacts in some parts of the uh, in some parts of the sequence, but there are some parts that are very good, very very realistic, like like this. So this seems to be in a good direction. Here is a part with clear artifacts. You can see some of the wheels disappear. That's definitely very interesting uh, to analyze, and we are working on, uh, uh, on improvements to this approach now, and we have some ideas uh, how to ameliorate, how to uh, avoid these artifacts. So we're not quite at perfection yet, um, but this seems, to be, uh, this seems to be a good direction, and the results are quite a bit better. Uh, than the other uh, recent, uh, recent approaches. Here is another scene. This is a playground scene. Again, unconstrained, real-world uh, scene, uh, handheld uh, video input. These are snapshots from the uh, input, uh, input video, and this is the set of uh, input images that were used as input to all the techniques. Here is the result of uh, local light field fusion.
here is extreme uh, view synthesis. Uh, here is neural radiance fields. Again, it's doing something. Uh, the results are not quite photorealistic. There are real artifacts, uh, but it's, it's clearly doing something interesting. It's doing something interesting that we will look into in more detail uh, in just a few moments. And here there is also free view synthesis. Here again, it's instructive to note that, first of all, this is just much better uh, than the baselines. It's clearly much, much more realistic uh, and sharper than the baselines. And it's also very interesting to look at the remaining artifacts and what they are due to. Look at the slide and look at the interior of the slide and you can see that the interior of the slide disappears. You can see that it's, uh, that it's missing in some frame. The reason it's missing is because it was not reconstructed well by multi-view stereo. The interior of this slide is a large, shiny, flat, featureless surface. And it, it, these kinds of surfaces are the kinds of surfaces that multi-view stereo fails on. Uh, essentially, the multi-view stereo system we used did not reconstruct the interior of the slide. It's just missing in the uh, 3D reconstruction and uh, free view synthesis um, inherits this limitation even though uh, it does have uh, some deep networks uh, that are then do that can structurally perform in painting and could in principle compensate um, for this incomplete reconstruction by in painting the slide during the decoding stage during the neural rendering stage this in practice is not happening here, and it's clear that uh, here the uh, reliance on uh, multi-view stereo and meshing to provide a scaffold uh, for the uh, view synthesis uh, is, uh, is biting us. Uh, it, it also reveals its, uh, its drawbacks and, um, and, and limitations, and this is again something that is instructive to think about as we think of the path forward and how we can uh, alleviate these artifacts, make the system uh, more robust to, uh, to such limitations in the individual modules. So this provides, a, I think, a fairly good overview of uh, where free view, view synthesis stands and where that approach stands. And now I want to talk about the second work um, I am presenting today, uh, which is joint work with Kai Zhang, uh, Gernot Riegler, and uh, Noah Snavely. Uh, so Kai uh, has been an intern uh, in my lab uh, this year, um, and this is his internship uh, project, and uh, Noah is uh, his advisor uh, at Cornell. And we've had a, a very interesting and uh, educational time looking into NERF, looking into radiance uh, neural radiance fields, thinking about modeling decisions that that approach makes, um, and trying to understand um, why it works well when it does, why it fails when it does, and what we can do um, to make it more stable, uh, to make it succeed more often, and to guard against some of the failure modes that we have uncovered. So uh, our running title is NERF++, Analyzing and Improving Neural Radiance Fields. And again, this is work that is presented for the first time. The paper is not public yet. You are the first to see this and we expect to post the uh, paper online in about a week. Our paper is inspired by and is a direct follow-up to this very interesting ECCV paper, NERF, uh, representing scenes as neural radiance fields 
for view uh, synthesis. And this paper is of interest in part because it takes a radically different approach to the view uh, synthesis problem. You saw that the free view synthesis approach that I presented was quite modular. It used classic components like uh, multi-view stereo, uh, meshing, surface reconstruction, um, these things that the community has been working on for, uh, for, for decades now. NERF is different and is a much more radical uh, approach. Um, here is the essence of the neural radiance uh, fields uh, representation. Consider a ray in uh, three space. A ray is a five-dimensional construct. It has five degrees of freedom. Uh, three degrees of freedom for its origin, x, three degrees of freedom in space, and two degrees of freedom for the ray direction, d. So five degrees of freedom for the ray. The NERF representation, in essence, is to estimate a function that, for each ray, computes the color and density associated with that ray. So for each ray xd, the neural radiance field um, estimates a color, that's three dimensions, RGB color, and density, density sigma. So in total, the output is four dimensional. Now, that density basically says uh, whether there is a surface there, whether there is an object at point X or uh, not. So ideally, uh, if the point X falls on the surface of or in the interior of an opaque object, sigma should be one. If X is in free space, just empty space, sigma should be zero. And if there's perhaps some participating medium or uncertainty, some fog or some, some translucent uh, surface, sigma can be between uh, zero and one. All right? So uh, this output, uh, color, radiance, and uh, uh, opacity, uh, density is associated with each ray in uh, three space. So given another ray, uh, X prime, D prime, uh, NERF will output uh, a color, C prime, and a density, sigma prime, associated with that other uh, ray. So NERF is a function, um, a, a, an approximation, uh, of this radiance field, a function that maps from the five-dimensional space of rays to the four-dimensional space of uh, colors and, uh, and uh, densities. And uh, in practice, uh, the representation is a multi-layer uh, perceptron. So uh, the NERF training process approximates this latent function with a multi-layer perceptron. It fits a multi-layer perceptron to this function, and then you can, at test time, query this multi-layer perceptron with XD pairs, and the multi-layer perceptron will output an estimated color and density for any ray you give it, for any uh, ray you query it with. Given such a NERF, given such a uh, neural radiance field implementation, you can synthesize images very easily. Given a camera, you trace rays out of the camera into the scene, perhaps along each pixel, and then you step along each ray. So you sample along each ray, and uh, for each sample point, um, you ask, what's the density here? The density here is zero. Well, you know, you keep going. Uh, at some point, you'll hit a very high density, density one, and you will also get the colors associated with these points. And you simply integrate the density and color along each ray to um, estimate the radiance along this uh, ray. So in an idealized uh, uh, setting, uh, you may step 
along this ray and hit density zero, zero, zero while the ray travels in free space. And then at some point you'll hit density one. Uh, you'll sample, you'll hit density one, meaning you hit an object. The ray hit an object. And then you ask, what's the color? Nerf gives you the color uh, from this point in the direction of, uh, of the ray. Um, and uh, everything is well. You now have the, uh, the color and you know the color of that, uh, uh, that pixel, the radiance along uh, that ray. And the training process uh, follows uh, very naturally from this image synthesis process. For training, you can just hold out uh, some image from your training set and then use the partially trained NERF to render uh, an image from that same pose. Uh, the whole rendering process is differentiable. So you render an image and then you compare to your ground truth held out image from this camera and you attach a loss to the discrepancy, the difference between the two images, the generated image and uh, the ground truth uh, image. We've been analyzing NERF because we've been intrigued by this approach and by some settings in which it works well and some settings in which it fails in surprising and, and, and sometimes uh, really catastrophic uh, ways. And we uncovered three uh, problems, uh, three issues uh, with the uh, NERF uh, approach. The first is what we call the shape radiance ambiguity. Uh, the second is uh, something that we refer to as the near field ambiguity. And the third is a parameterization uh, issue that becomes very important uh, when we uh, tackle large real world scenes like the kinds of unbounded scenes, uh, large outdoor environments as you saw uh, in uh, the Freeview synthesis videos and the tanks and, uh, and temples data set. Let's start with these first two issues, the two ambiguities, the shape radiance ambiguity and the near field ambiguity. And these two issues can be traced to one fundamental factor. That factor is NERF is overparameterized. NERF represents the radiance field with five parameters. The space of rays is five dimensional after all. But many of you may recall that the classic representations for radiance for the planoptic function in computer graphics used four dimensional parameterizations. These were four dimensional uh, constructs. Why is that? Well, the reason is that the intrinsic dimensionality of uh, the radiance field is more like four than five. It is a somewhat um, ambiguous uh, construct, but I think we can say um, with some confidence that the intrinsic dimensionality uh, of the radiance field is closer to four than five. Why is that? Well, first of all, look at the modeling decisions uh, made in the classic, uh, in these classic representations of uh, the planoptic function in, com uh, in computer graphics. If you look at, let's say, an image plane, okay, a plane through which you want to view the scene, the space of rays that cross this image plane, uh, that emanate from this image plane, clearly becomes uh, four-dimensional. Uh, so this is, this is obvious, uh, this is uh, basic, uh, basic geometry, and that is the, um, uh, the, the root of the four-dimensional parameterizations um, adopted uh, by uh, prior representations of uh, the radiance field. But what about whole scenes, you might say? I don't want to just view the scene through a plane. I want to travel freely through uh, the scene. What happens then? Well, what happens there is 
a, a very important, a critical, fundamental property of radiance, which is that radiance is constant along a ray that travels through free space. So, as a ray travels through free space, radiance is constant. So you might think that there is a degree of freedom there. You are traveling along a ray, so you are changing something. There is a degree of freedom. This degree of freedom is in some sense illusory. It's, uh, it's, it's redundant. There is no freedom. The radiance is constant. Nothing changes. As you travel along a ray in free space, nothing changes. So the interesting events where radiance actually changes, if you don't have participating media, are along surfaces of objects. So surfaces of objects are two-dimensional. So the, um, the origin can be parameterized by two dimensions. The direction of the ray gets two more dimensions. We get a four-dimensional manifold. The radiance function, the informative part of it, the interesting part of it, where something actually happens, uh, is really a four-dimensional manifold. The rest is basically determined by uh, this four-dimensional uh, manifold. And what we will see is that not modeling this constancy of radiance, this radiance constancy uh, along rays, has serious deleterious consequences. It has serious drawbacks in that NERF has, in some sense, too much freedom, too much expressivity for its own good, in that it can fit the training objective absolutely perfectly and at the same time hallucinate a completely incorrect solution, a solution that's arbitrarily wrong while fitting its train ob training objective perfectly. So let's see this in action with the shape radiance uh, ambiguity. Consider uh, two rays from two cameras that see the same point, for example, uh, on our uh, lovely uh, teapot. And um, you might imagine that the following, the following happens for a well-trained nerf. Uh, you step along each of these rays from the camera, you sample, 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 you get density zero, while you're sampling in free space, and then you hit the surface of the teapot, and you get density one. Okay, that's, that's what we want NERF to learn. That's what we imagine it learns. And indeed, it can learn that. That would be a valid solution that would fit the training objective uh, perfectly. But there are also, there is also an infinite continuum, an infinite space of arbitrarily wrong solutions that will also fit the training objective perfectly. Here is one of them. Uh, instead of the teapot, let's just hallucinate that the geometry of this scene is a perfect sphere. And there's nothing special here about the sphere. It can be any other shape. Let's hallucinate that the geometry of the scene is this red sphere. And let's uh, fit the nerve training objective by assigning uh, density one along this sphere and the right radiance along this ray. So in training, um, we're going to just say that um, as we step along this ray, the density will be one when the ray hits the sphere and uh, the radiance along this ray will be correct. It, it will be what it needs to be uh, to match the training image from this camera and likewise from this camera. In this way, we can fit the training objective of NERF with this arbitrarily wrong solution that has nothing to do with reality perfectly. We can drive the training objective to zero. Again, this goes back to this extra degree of freedom and this extra expressivity 
uh, in, uh, in NERF that can be abused, that allows NERF to be deceived, to deceive it uh, itself. Of course, the deleterious consequences are that even though all the training images are fit perfectly, the training images are indistinguishable from reality, as soon as you depart from the training images, you go into new poses, the appearance of the scene will shatter. It will break down completely. What you'll start seeing is, is, is basically uh, soup. It's basically noise that uh, has nothing to do with the original images because the solution was basically overfit uh, perfectly to the training images but it is incredibly uh, brittle. Since the underlying estimated geometry of the scene is completely wrong, um, once you start moving the camera away from the training uh, poses, you will see just really horrible results. And we can reliably invoke this in controlled exper uh, experiments. This does happen. We can invoke this on demand uh, in control experiments, this is real, and we can reproduce uh, this basically at will. Now, in fact, the relevant question becomes, since it's so easy for NERF to be deceived, and it's so easy to drive the training objective to zero with an arbitrarily bad solution, the next interesting question is, why does NERF ever work? Why does NERF work at all? Why does it, in fact, ever find the right solution and not any of these uh, infinitely bad uh, solution, any of this infinity of bad solutions that would also fit the objective? And this has to do uh, with a uh, decision made in the implementation of the NERF approach that is rarely discussed and uh, seems to be underappreciated, which is the following. This, from my description so far, is what you might think uh, NERF is doing. Uh, it feeds some representation of uh, the ray, the origin and direction of the ray, by the way, NERF uses a clever encoding of uh, the uh, ray parameters into Fourier uh, features. This is actually orthogonal uh, to the point uh, we are uh, studying here. So that encoding is nice, useful, and clever. Um, but that is not the point uh, here. It is important. It's good. Uh, it helps improve the results but it's completely orthogonal uh, to, uh, to the point we are making here. So, NERF feeds some encoding uh, of the ray parameters, encoded as Fourier features or whatever, into a multi-layer perceptron, and you might think that this is what's happening, and then it produces this multi-layer per uh, perceptron, outputs the color and uh, density. That's what you would think from my description so far, and I think this is what many people think is happening, but that is not what is happening. What's really happening is actually extremely important. It's very different, uh, and this difference is extremely important. What travels through the bulk of this multilayer perceptron is just the origin of the ray, uh, the encoding of the three spatial coordinates. So the vast majority, the bulk uh, of the NERF network is not view dependent at all. It has only three degrees of freedom, not even four, three degrees of freedom. The other two degrees of freedom, the view dependent uh, branch, start here. The view dependent uh, path begins here in the penultimate layer and basically goes through a single layer. Uh, the ray direction, which are these extra degrees of freedom that NERF can use to basically fail arbitrarily badly and encode um, a completely incorrect hallucinated geometry uh, to fit the uh, training uh, data, 
that is, uh, those degrees of freedom are fed to the network only at the very, very end and go basically through one or two nonlinearities, depending on how you look at it, let's say one. Um, it's an extremely shallow uh, subnetwork that is starved of capacity. So what's happening here is that there is a structural regularization, an implicit regularization that um, is rarely talked about but is in fact critical of starving the network of capacity such that the network simply doesn't have enough capacity to overfit uh, the data. Uh, this is very important because if you follow the general program I described earlier and you do something like this, the um, failures of uh, of NERF really, really multiply. The shape radiance ambiguity becomes uh, really uh, uh, a, a big uh, problem and much easier uh, to uh, invoke. So it's important to remember that this rarely discussed and un unappreciated structural implicit regularization actually is one of the most important uh, uh, one of the most important decisions in making NERF actually work when it uh, does. Uh, a related ambiguity that also uh, harnesses this overparameterization of uh, of NERF and basically preys uh, on the uh, extra degree of freedom that NERF has is the near field uh, ambiguity. And the near field ambiguity is another way in which NERF can cheat to perfectly fit the training data um, while hallucinating completely incorrect geometry, completely incorrect scene structure, and failing to generalize uh, completely. And the basic uh, idea is that in the near part of its view frusta, for example, look at this camera, there is a part of its view frustum that is not observed by any other camera, that is not triangulated by other cameras. And in this part of its view frustum, NERF can easily just hallucinate the training image. So during training, NERF in the extreme, for example, can just put a little billboard uh, with a painted training image on it right here in front of the camera and be very happy. It can just hallucinate the training image right in front of the camera and be perfectly happy uh, and fit the training objective uh, absolutely perfectly, drive the loss to zero, and of course completely fail to reconstruct the scene such that when the camera moves, um, the image uh, breaks down completely because uh, NERF hasn't learned anything uh, useful. The third issue that we analyze and aim to rectify in our work is the issue of parametrization. Uh, the issue here is that NERF uh, parametrizes the entire scene essentially in a compact volume. Let's say, for simplicity, a, a unit cube, a, a, 3D, uh, a 3D unit cube. So the entire uh, relevant volume of the scene is projected to a unit cube, and this is the domain over which the multilayer perceptron is uh, trained and estimated. This is the domain um, to which the multilayer perceptron allocates its uh, capacity. This creates a problem when the scene has very high spatial dynamic range. So, uh, for example, if you have foreground. Uh, objects that are right in front of the camera that are uh, that are viewed in great detail where it's very important to estimate this detail let's say a meter two meters from the camera um, that uh, part will be allocated capacity along with the rest of the scene but what if the rest of the scene is actually huge and it it's also important that we actually see this rest of, uh, of the scene because the camera can look at it and, and, and see tens of meters, hundreds of meters, maybe a kilometer away. So what we see in many real world capture settings is that there are objects in the foreground and front of uh, the camera, objects of interest 
that need to be reconstructed in great detail, but the camera can also see past them. And there is a backdrop that's maybe hundreds of meters away, but it's also very important that we see that uh, at the appropriate level of detail. And NERF must trade these off because it has finite capacity, it has a finite sample budget, it has a finite training uh, time. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the details, if you look at its structure. And what happens in practice is if the uh, uh, foreground part of the scene uh, is allocated a lot of capacity, then the background ends up reconstructed poorly and is blurry. Whereas if we emphasize, if we somehow project um, the whole scene into this unit cube over which the multi-layer perceptron is, uh, is trained and, and operates, then the background might be a bit better, um, but then the foreground is, uh, is, is very blurry. So there is kind of a, a, a zero-sum uh, game that is happening because finite capacity is allocated over uh, a scene that's potentially very large and with even more important than uh, large, than absolute spatial extent, it, it may have very high spatial dynamic uh, range. We discuss a number of solutions in our work that make NERF work better. And this is what we call NERF++. To uh, guard against the shape radiance ambiguity, we introduce uh, acute auxiliary loss uh, that helps a nerve steer away from the poor solutions that misestimate the geometry of uh, the scene. To guard against the near field ambiguity, we introduce an adaptive near field uh, culling that uh, culls the front part of each view frustum adaptively based on the uh, geometry of the scene and tries to uh, disallow estimating geometry uh, right in front of uh, the camera uh, as uh, the vanilla nerf is liable to uh, do. And then finally, uh, to uh, handle the parameterization issue in the uh, original NERF, we introduce a neat homogeneous uh, parameterization that allows you to have high detail reconstruction in the foreground as well as detailed reconstruction of the background. Now let me just show you this homogeneous parameterization because it, it makes a big difference in practice and it's actually very simple. The basic idea is that we train two nerfs. One nerf for the foreground, uh, part of the scene that is designated as the interior, the foreground part of the scene uh, that is enclosed by a uh, sphere. Uh, let's just change the scale for convenience. So this is the unit sphere. This is a compact region. We can just train the NERF with its uh, basic parameterization for the compact region. The entire scene outside uh, this sphere is reprojected. It's folded into a four-dimensional unit cube. And this is a very simple reparameterization. This is a very simple uh, reprojection that basically folds the unbounded three-dimensional space outside the unit sphere into a higher dimensional, into a four-dimensional uh, unit cube. Note that there does not need to be any scene boundary in this unit sphere. It really doesn't matter what actually happens. In this scene, at this unit sphere, you will not see the boundary. The way the approach is structured, uh, you will not see a boundary when you render the scene, but you simply cleverly allocate capacity to uh, a foreground region where the, the camera is more liable to look at objects closely and examine them in detail, 
as well as the background, which you, you want to be there and you want to synthesize and you want it to be sharp, but doesn't need to be modeled at the same level of spatial detail. Let's look at some results and let's compare NERF++ with these ideas to the baseline NERF. Let's look again at the truck scene. These are the input images from the tanks and temples truck scene. And here is a comparison of NERF and NERF++. In parenthesis, uh, I put the PSNR for each approach. And you see that NERF++ gains 2 decibels in PSNR. And this 10% improvement in PSNR, in this case, is very significant. It corresponds to very clear uh, differences in visual uh, quality. The truck is sharper. You can see the writing. Uh, on the side of the truck. You can see the details on the wheels. Uh, you can see uh, the sign on the back uh, much more clearly. Um, the background is better preserved. Uh, the whole scene is really quite a bit better and you see it even more clearly when you view the videos at uh, high resolution. So we really, we really have done something here. Um, here is another tanks and temples scene. This is the train. Here you again see the input images just so you can see um, what the scene itself looks like and what input was provided to the different uh, techniques. And here are the results of NERF and NERF++. Again, you can see the writing is much sharper. Uh, you can see um, the surface of the train at much uh, better detail. And uh, you can see the background much better as well. Note that uh, we really went out of our way to make the vanilla nerf uh, work as well as possible and to make the comparison as fair as possible. First of all, you will notice that the sequences that I'm showing here for the Manila nerve are better than the sequences we showed for NERF in the free view synthesis comparisons. Why is that? The main reason is that NERF++ has twice the sample budget of the vanilla nerve. Uh, because of this homogeneous parameterization, we are in effect training two nerves. Each nerf gets uh, the baseline sample budget, but the two nerfs together, which comprise nerf plus plus, gets tw get twice as many samples. So, to make the comparison maximally fair, to equalize uh, the samples and the training time and the capacity given to uh, nerf and nerf plus plus, we also train the baseline nerf for twice as long with twice as many. Uh, samples. We give it the same sample budget as NERF++, which is twice as high as uh, the settings for the NERF, the baseline settings for NERF that were used in the free view synthesis uh, comparisons. That alone makes NERF work better uh, in uh, these new comparisons that I uh, that I'm showing you. And we also really went out of our way to tune the hyperparameters basically manually as well as possible to really make the vanilla nerf work just as well as possible with extensive manual hyperparameter tuning. So the vanilla nerf results here for these reasons are better. Uh, than the vanilla nerf results you saw in the free view synthesis comparisons, but still uh, they are clearly not uh, photorealistic and clearly not great. Um, and nerf plus plus is uh, much better. Here is another scene. This is the playground scene. Some input images. And here again is the comparison of nerf and nerf plus plus. Uh, nerf on the left, again, you see it's quite blurry. Uh, nerf on the right, you will see it's sharper, both in the foreground and in uh, the background. 
it's not quite perfect. Actually, it's far from perfect. Photorealism has not been attained, but it's really quite a bit better. Finally, let's look at the M60 sequence. Here are the input images again. And here is Nerf and Nerf++. Plus Plus. Uh, again, the original Nerf is quite blurry. Uh, not a complete failure at all, but um, definitely not photorealistic. The Nerf++ Plus Plus on the right is, is much closer. Still not perfect, but clearly quite a bit sharper, quite a bit more realistic. We can make out the details uh, much, much better. I want to close uh, with some broader uh, discussion of the approaches that uh, we reviewed today, the trade-offs between them, the outlook into uh, the future, and some closing thoughts on the pursuit of uh, photorealism. Let's begin with uh, an analyzing the runtime of the two approaches we saw today because it is another factor that is uh, quite important um, but uh, not, not commonly discussed, it seems, and, and somewhat underappreciated. Uh, both Nerf and Nerf++ Plus Plus require per-scene training. Uh, this per-scene training uh, takes, in our experiments, about three days uh, per scene on a high-end GPU, uh, on a 2080 Ti GPU. Three days uh, for a single scene. Note that here, this is with the higher sample budget and the higher training time that we used for uh, the Nerf and Nerf++ Plus Plus, uh, results uh, that I showed you over the last few minutes that were really maximized for just maximal visual quality. You can reduce the training time, but that will hurt the visual quality. So to get the visual quality that I just showed you over the next few slides, that takes uh, about three days of uh, training per scene on a high-end uh, GPU. Freeview synthesis does not train its networks per uh, scene. The networks don't need to be fine-tuned uh, for a new scene, but it does run multi-view stereo and surface reconstruction. Those take time. Uh, they take about two hours uh, for a representative scene in our experiments on the same hardware. So the comparison is about three days uh, of per-scene training uh, for Nerf and Nerf++ Plus Plus, and about to about two hours for per scene investment by free view synthesis for running multi vistera and surface reconstruction. All the approaches rely on structure from motion to localize the cameras for the input images. And that takes about 10 minutes. So that is uh, very reasonable. So those 10 minutes, uh, I think everybody is, uh, uh, is, is, is pretty happy uh, with. But the per scene training is, um, is an issue. We can, of course, assume uh, that, uh, that the implementations have not been exhaustively optimized, and you could perhaps gain uh, an order of magnitude uh, in performance with further investment, but uh, these costs are, are substantial. Furthermore, let's look at the runtime of synthesizing an image with each of the approaches. So synthesizing an HD 720p uh, image with Nerf and Nerf++, Plus Plus, again, with our settings, with the higher sample budget, hyperparameters set for higher visual quality, takes about one to two minutes on the same high-end uh, recent GPU, on a 2080 uh, Ti GPU. One to two minutes, minutes, to synthesize a single image. Free view synthesis takes roughly one second uh, to synthesize an uh, image. That second uh, is spent on doing forward passes in the encoder and decoder networks and reprojecting uh, the features from the nearby uh, input views to the uh, target view. It's safe to assume that neither of these two implementations have been optimized for uh, high speed, high rate image uh, synthesis. 
I think it's reasonable to assume that there is uh, an order of magnitude that can be gained with less than a month of work by just optimizing these. But right now, the two approaches, the image synthesis time differs by two orders of magnitude. So if we gain that one order of magnitude with, uh, with dedicated optimization, FVS would probably enter the interactive regime, will probably be at uh, 10, 20 frames per second, whereas NERF and NERF++ plus plus, um, will probably go down to on the order of 10 seconds of synthesis or at least multiple seconds per image to synthesize one image, uh, which is still quite far uh, from, uh, from real time and quite far from satisfactory. Again, an aspect that, um, uh, that, that seems to be under, uh, underappreciated at the uh, moment. As I mentioned, the two approaches are, are actually quite different in their philosophy. Free view synthesis is quite modular. It leverages components that are of independent interest and have independent momentum behind them and communities that are devoted to advancing these components like multi-view stereo and uh, 3D reconstruction. NERF and NERF++ plus plus, uh, are more radical uh, and involve a more fundamental reconsideration of the, uh, the view synthesis pipeline. Um, and uh, NERF was interesting to us for that reason. We wanted to understand this radical approach better uh, and understand the trade-offs and how far it can be, uh, it can be pushed. One note I want to make is that there is a common misunderstanding here about end-to-end -end and its relationship with modularity. A common misunderstanding is that there is a kind of dichotomy between end-to-end -end training and modular design, that either you have a modular system or you have end-to-end -end training. In reality, there is no such dichotomy. End-to-end -end training is perfectly compatible with modularity you can have a modular system and you can do gradient-based training such that in the very least the later modules adapt to the performance characteristics of the earlier modules. So in Freeview Synthesis, for example, the neural rendering module can adapt to the uh, drawbacks and can in part compensate for the drawbacks of multi-view stereo and surface reconstruction. Of course, some of those drawbacks may be too severe and the uh, later module may just not have the structure, the expressive power to completely, uh, perfectly compensate for uh, the drawbacks if the earlier module fails. But end-to-end -end training is possible, and adaptation to uh, the failures of earlier modules is possible. So a failure or a limitation of an earlier module need not result in a complete collapse of, uh, of uh, the, whole, uh, the whole system. Freeview synthesis is designed to essentially ride uh, on uh, future improvements to multi-view stereo and uh, surface reconstruction. Here you can see the uh, Tanks and Temples leaderboard that shows the progress in multi-view stereo that has been made just over the last two years. And you see hundreds of approaches on the leaderboard pushing the performance of multi-view stereo. And, and this is significant. There has been real progress in multi-view stereo in the last two, three years. This is real. The numbers have moved substantially and the numbers actually mean something. The, the, the reconstructions really are getting better and better and better uh, by the year. The most important general thought is that both methods presented today are far from perfect. Neither attains the level of photorealism that I think we should be striving for. We are far from done. There are glaring artifacts in the results of both approaches. Glaring artifacts remain 
for both approaches. You can see them even here at half resolution on this slide when the approaches are compared side by side, and you can see them even more clearly when you examine the results full screen uh, at high resolution, which I encourage all of you uh, to do. Now, which is which? Can you guess? Which is the result of free view synthesis, and which of these videos is the result of NERF++? The video on the left is uh, the result of free view synthesis. The video on the right is the result of NERF++. In parentheses, you see their PSNR, and you see that it's comparable. Uh, the artifacts in the two approaches are different. They don't make the same mistakes. Um, they introduce different artifacts that end up balancing out uh, the uh, numbers. My most important message for you is that there is plenty of work for you to do if you want to enter this area and help us drive towards photorealism. There are plenty of interesting problems we are not done, and plenty of deep and interesting work remains to attain the level of photorealism we are striving towards. A final thought is that neither of these view synthesis approaches presented today gives us the level of control over the scene that physics-based methods provide. With physics-based methods, the scene is interactive. We can move objects around, we can animate them, we can change the lighting, uh, we can just engage with the scene, reconfigure it interactively, and do anything we want with it. Whereas the view synthesis techniques presented today really only allow us to walk around the scene that is frozen in time. They allow us to watch, to view a scene as it was when the original images were taken. Um, the scene cannot be manipulated. We cannot really engage with it and modify it and reconfigure it. And this is a big drawback of these approaches and a very exciting opportunity for future work future work that I think is very important and would be great for all of us to engage in. And I will reiterate my belief that the ultimate solution to photorealism will marry physics-based and image-based techniques. The ultimate solution will be a union, a synergy of physics-based and image-based ideas and as evidence I will again play a uh, clip from this beautiful computer-generated uh, short by Alex Roman that has been inspiring me uh, for uh, more than a decade now because this clip has attained, in my view, photorealism. This is photorealistic, and yet we can engage uh, with this scene. Uh, we can manipulate it. We see um, a realistic simulation of light transport in uh, this scene, and we can see the amazing level of quality, the sharpness, the detail, and this is the sharpness and the clarity of appearance that we should all strive for. Thank you very much for your attention today.